Good morning. How are y'all doing? There are some uncomfortable chairs in the middle right there if y'all want to find a spot or over there for the people in the back. I know how uh, wonderful those chairs are, so it's great. Um, you must be here for OpenStack Identity Federation, which is good. Um, we'd like to go ahead and start off by thanking a whole bunch of companies that actually contributed to what we've done within Ice House. Red Hat, CERN, University of Kent, I represent Rackspace with Jorge here, and IBM, Brad, and Steve. A lot, of, a lot of good companies came together when we looked at how to do Identity Federation, what kind of protocols we should support, how it would work from the API layer, how to implement it. And so this is a, this is a story of great collaboration, first off. So who are we? My name is Joe Savick. I'm Rackspace Identity Product Manager. We have Brad Topol, IBM Distinguished Engineer, Jorge Williams, Principal Architect with uh, Rackspace, and Steve Martinelli, uh, Keystone Core IBM Software Developer. There's a lot of other core software developers for Keystone in the room. Can you raise your hand? Thank you very much. OK, so I know it's been a little while, but how many of y'all remember on Monday when Troy presented this slide. This is a pretty cool image, isn't it? You can kind of move the scales up and down and decide the cloud that you want to go to. It's a perfect use case for a cloud broker use case, right? So if I have a workload that uh, needs to be very cost efficient but doesn't need to be that performant, I could go to the cost-oriented uh, cloud. If I want something that uh, I need the support there, I could go to the support cloud. But we have these bridges. I don't know if you see them. We have these bridges in between the clouds. And that's kind of what we're talking about here today, is how to define those bridges in a secure way. And it starts with identity federation. So federation. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of definitions for what federation is. And again, we're concentrating on identity federation. So this is using one identity to securely access resources across multiple different clouds. Uh, so you have the endpoints across these services within your service catalog. Uh, it's maintained by a trusted identity provider. It could be your employer provided credentials that you use. And you don't have to re-log in all the time. So uh, and enables single sign-on. Why do we want to do this? Well, whenever you provision an identity from one cloud to another cloud or from one service provider to another service provider, it's a security risk. It becomes a management nightmare as well, especially when you have a whole bunch of users over in universities or in big corporations that move in and out and, and fluid, right? How do you know that you turned off access when an employee got terminated across all services that they had access to? But I want to concentrate on, slide, on point five and six. The best test of interoperability in the cloud is to enable one identity. Without one identity working across multiple clouds, it's a big blocker. You have to be able to change your clients to be able to work with multiple tokens representing access to the different clouds. You can't burst as easily from one cloud to another cloud or from your dedicated hardware and your uh, data center over to a public cloud. Um, so we need to be able to solve for identity federation first in order to be able to test the true interoperability. So when we talk about identity federation, there's a lot of, oh, well, do you support this protocol? Do you support that protocol? Uh, one thing I want to get uh, uh, make clear on this slide is that it's extensible. We built it to be extensible. The federation protocols, um, we have SAML within Icehouse. Um, we're, we're working on OpenID Connect. And we can also do, uh, David Chadwick, uh, you mentioned AbFab. You know, we, you can absolutely commit to that. And uh, the uh, contracts are built to be extensible to be able to handle that. R2-D2, yes. Uh, the big picture, what do we have within Icehouse? So this is, this is what Icehouse delivers. Uh, the prerequisite is uh, uh, Apache running ModShib. Many people already run Apache around Keystone today. so. That shouldn't be too much of a problem. And R2D2 represents kind of the employer portal or the access manager. So you would log in with your employer provided credentials into this access manager. You would be able to click on go to cloud. 
and it, it does a handling for you of SAML. So the SAML handshake with the identity provider and sending that information off to a Keystone cloud in order to be able to get back an unscoped token representing access to that cloud. And then you do what you normally would do at that point. You would get the projects and domains that you have access to, and you would go ahead and uh, uh, request a scope token for access to that cloud. So this is great. This enables you to be able to use your employer provided credentials against the cloud. But that's not cloud to cloud identity federation. Before we get to that, I wanted to let you know that uh, we're kind of talking future state here. There's design sessions going on. This is kind of a, an idea that we have on how it could be implemented. It's not set in stone. There's a blueprint down there. Uh, feedback is appreciated. Um, I encourage you all to attend the design sessions or hit me up or any of the other gentlemen up here on stage with me uh, to provide feedback. So the big picture, we covered what R2D2 does, right? Well, what if you go ahead and get a token from Keystone 1 cloud and you want to use it against Keystone 2? So you would want to be able to go ahead and send that token to Keystone 2 to provision a server. This could be for auto scale reasons. This could be for cloud bursting. It could be for cloud brokering. There's a lot of different use cases. Image portability, there's a lot of use cases that this could solve for. So how does, how does Cloud 2, Keystone 2 know that you are who you say you are, and you have access to what you say you have access to. At this point, Nova just handles it as if it was just any other token. So no change within Nova to go ahead and send that token back to the local Keystone to be able to validate the token. But at that point, there's a, a decode token origin, and I'll jump into that, where Keystone 2 defines, OK, well, this token was issued by Cloud 1, the Keystone one, and needs to go back there in order to be able to uh, validate that that is an accurate token. And there's a federation protocol handshake that happens there. You remember on the, on the other side, there was a protocol handshake in between the identity provider and R2D2. There's now one in between Cloud2 and Cloud1. So what do, I, what do I mean by decode token? A uh, federated token needs to include information about where the originating authentication actually occurred. It needs to know, OK, who, where did you get this token? I need to figure out uh, if that's a, a trusted place that I could go to. And there's a trust relationship in between clouds I'll jump into here a little bit as well. One potential solution is to have this within the token metadata and includes the originating identity provider, the protocol that they support, and the subject or user that came across in the token. Um, at this point, I got to say that, uh, that I like the work that we're doing with CADF. It really supports uh, the auditing use cases that we're looking at, and it's kind of important to be able to have that. Um, so that way we could trace from cloud to cloud to cloud uh, what a user is actually doing. So how do tr clouds trust each other? So it's important first that clouds indicate what they support. So I support a Nova instance, or I support uh, the Swift API. So that way they could, uh, you could build a service catalog that represents a total scope of what an identity could do across these clouds. But it's also important to be able to set up explicit trust. And there's trust as an identity provider from one cloud to another. And then there's trust as a service provider from one cloud to another. And so in this case, cloud one uh, trusts cloud two as a service provider. Um, so that way, any identity is authenticating uh, could be given those endpoints surfaced by cloud two. And now on the other hand, uh, the cloud two trusts cloud one as an identity provider. So that way, when it comes across as an assertion, as a token comes across, and it decodes the originating identity provider, it knows where to go back to and trust that that's, that's a solid point or, or originating identity provider point. So when we connect all these together, eventually we start forming this uh, uh, cohesive federation of rebel alliances, right? Where we could speak different protocols to be able to authenticate to a cloud, get access across multiple clouds. Uh, and, uh, and in many cases, there aren't uh, any client changes that are absolutely uh, actually needed. You see Chewbacca right there using the standard username password as they do today and not needing to federate directly into the cloud. OK, right now I'm going to go ahead and turn it off to Brad Topol to talk about what was delivered within Nice House. Great. Thanks, Joe. Um, so getting started here, there is a quote from our fearless PTL. 
Dolph, raise your hand. Where are you? I can't find you. That's amazing. My eyes are terrible. Go ahead and stand up. Dolph, Dolph is a, who leads us on what we're doing, and, and this is his quote. OS Federation extension allows Keystone to consume federated authentication uh, via an Apache module for multiple identity providers, mapping federated attributes into OpenStack group-based based role assignments. We're going to go through that and actually put that into English. Um, now, the Keystone team, and we've got all the cores there, and we've got um, lots of folks here, we really, really believe in stakeholder-driven development. And we were very lucky that on this particular topic, um, we were honored to have Merrick Denis. Merrick, stand up, please. He is one of those super users that the caricatures are there. Um, Merrick is at CERN. Uh, this was one of their key requirements. And so as the development has been ongoing, you know, you're getting the validation uh, just in classic agile development of, of being able to do this. So thank you, Merrick. And we're going to keep doing that. And for all the stuff that we do in Keystone, um, we love having stakeholders like Merrick. So please, when you have stuff, you should know the right names to contact, Dolph, it's others. We, this is how we like to do this. So please. So here's what we're going to go through and talk about. We're going to talk about the, the new APIs and why you need them. We're going to talk about the magic, which is the mappings. Um, and then after that, I'm going to hand over to one of the, the, the key developers, Steve Martinelli, uh, and he's going to get into some of the, the authentication details and how they're different. Um, uh, one thing to point out is most of you use Keystone. I'm sure you use the, the, the Python Keystone client. We're actively, and actually Merrick has helped coding this, we're actively putting a lot of what we're going to describe here into the client, so that will come soon. It's a work in progress patch. But I'm going to go through and describe things using the existing RESTful APIs. And Merrick, you had a, an existing version of your client that you used for your work, and that'll get into the client uh, hopefully quickly. But what do we need to do here? Well, the first thing we need to do is you're going to have different identity providers. We need to find a way to register them. So very simple RESTful API here to register. You've got a description for your identity provider. You get to give it ID. Um, nice and easy. Similarly, your different identity pro uh, uh, providers can have different protocols. You could have SAML1, SAML2. Again, you know, the classic OpenStack model, we believe in being pluggable and lots of options uh, to, to meet everybody's needs. And so here you can see there's a nice simple API uh, where you can describe the protocol. And you look, you know, classic uh, RESTful API, you, you point out the IDP ID, and then you can uh, have the protocol ID and then, uh, you know, register the values. Um, we're going to get into this in a little more detail, but the magic to making this work is to be able to take the information that comes from the identity provider, typically in the form of things like Samuel assertions, and map them into the Keystone world uh, so that we can do the right things, set folks in the right roles, in the right groups. And the, the magic that there was a lot of work done and, and uh, was to provide a robust, robust mapping layer to accomplish this, and lots of iterations on that, um, and I'm sure it'll continue. But, but, but that's sort of you know, another piece that you need to get registered, and uh, you register it with a mapping ID. OK, so let's kind of level set and, and talk about classic Keystone. I love giving presentations on classic Keystone because the, the model is, is really straightforward. And I you know, get up there and I say, listen, you've got users and you typically map them to projects, they used to be called tenants, via a role. And that role is just a label. And all the other OpenStack projects take that information and they have their own policy engines and that's how they decide whether you're able to kick off uh, an instance or attach storage or whatever you want to do. So that's great and it works, but as we start moving to federated identity, there's a few problems that we're going to have to address. Uh, the first biggest one is, you know, in that model that I just talked about, you had the users, you map them via roles to the projects, the users were in Keystone, they might have been, you know, coming from LDAP, but they are essentially in Keystone. In federated identity, those users are no longer in Keystone. 
uh, kind of makes that original classic mapping a little difficult. So that's one of the big problems that we had to solve. Um, and really what we do is now what's coming from the identity provider is some notion of attribute values typically called assertions. And we're going to take those values and map them to groups. So we you know, maybe not know exactly who you are, but based on the attributes that you have, we know to put you in a group. And then we can do classic keystone, which is groups have the notion of roles, just like the classic model of, 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 of users. And now we got you in a group, and the group's got roles. All the rest of what I described in classic keystone is going to work. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if any of you have done this, but you can go, this is a little bit ugly, but, uh, you know, here you can create some groups, and down here you've got the, you know, you can put people in different groups, uh, and that's what you're seeing, some examples there. And we're associating the groups with a role. So we're, you know, setting, creating the groups and associating roles on the groups, just like you would just see on the users. Uh, I know that's a little hard to read, but that's the big concept there. And now things get a little interesting. We've got the notion of Samuel assertions. And so we've got some examples here. We've got one that for whatever reason has like a, a, a name, a username in it. Um, and then we've got some that were, you know, some attribute values for different types of identity groups. I think that, you know, that's typically the more common case. And so these are the kind of things that are gonna flow from the identity provider that we're gonna need to map into Keystone's world. Um, right now, to create the mapping, uh, there's a, a lot of details on this and, and docs on all the different features. They really worked hard, uh, a lot of iterations to make this very flexible. Um, and we'll continue to improve it. If we missed a few boundary cases, let us know. But the, the idea here is uh, from the remote identity provider, um, there's going to be certain attribute values like I showed on the previous slide. One example was, you know, uh, the type IDP group. And here we've got a mapping that says, hey, if that attribute comes in with the value of IBM Regular Employees Canada, map it to a group ID. And what happens is this information is going to get into the token that's created and that's how the rest of Keystone works to do its roles and, and what have you. Uh, similarly, we've got another one of those down below, but then we've got another one that's interesting, is maybe you need the username. So if any of you know me, um, I'm very big on cloud auditing. Uh, I gave a, a presentation earlier in the week on cloud auditing. You, you're really going to want to know the information coming in from those uh, identity providers to be able to figure out who's getting authorized, what have you. And so we've got a capability here where if the identity provider provides something like uh, subject as the type, which is essentially the username, we can map it in the token to a well-known value in the token called name. And since that value is going to get Pop, uh, populated on, I then get access to it when we plug in our auditing and, and we can uh, keep track of wonderful things like who's getting authorized. Okay, getting in. Uh, I'm going to hand off on the really hard details to Steve Martinelli before he falls off the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Brad. All right, so um, thanks, Brad, for explaining all the mapping portions of the new and the new APIs. But what do we actually want? We want a token back from Keystone. This way, we can use that token uh, to uh, use it in Nova or Cinder or any other OpenStack service. Uh, so really brief, briefly, I'm going to recap uh, what was the old Keystone authentication model. You would have a username and a password. You would uh, authenticate with Keystone and get back an unscoped token, right? Uh, once that happened, you would then go and query uh, to find out what projects or domains you have access to. Uh, once you find out the project that you want, you use that ID for the project along with the unscoped token, and then make a scope token request, get back the scope token, and then you can start using that in uh, Nova or Cinder or what have you. All right, so as Brad already touched up on this, there's one big issue in a federated Keystone environment, and that's that um, the user doesn't exist in Keystone. He exists in an IDP somewhere else. 
So as such, we've had to make a few tweaks, a few new APIs, but we want to keep the process as similar as we can to the old non-federated Keystone process. So you want to keep the unscoped, get the project ID, issue a scope token request. We want to keep that essentially as similar as we can. So part one, uh, we want to get back an, uns an unscoped token. So over here, the user is going to perform a get or a post request on the URL that you see above there. And what's going to happen is the IDP is actually going to go and intercept this request and then prompt the user to log in. And once the user has been authenticated, the IDP is then going to um, send a SAML assertion over to Keystone, which acts as a service provider in this case, at which point the, uh, once Keystone actually has the SAML assertion, it's got all the data it kind of needs at this point. Uh, if you look at the URL, it's got the IDP, it's got the protocol, and it's got the SAML assertion. You can find the mapping that you want to use that Brad talked about by uh, looking up the IDP and protocol. And then you can put the SAML assertion, all the attributes, you can push them all through the mapping engine. And then in the end, the mapping engine should output uh, group IDs and a username. So you can see over here, uh, we actually go ahead and stick those values into the unscoped token. So you can see over here, the user ID would, would be Steve Marr. And, the, and we have a new OS Federation kind of object there. And we uh, stick the group IDs in there as well. Um, why we want the group IDs is part two. So again, keeping with the same non-federated Keystone model, we want to find out what projects and domains we have access to. So we're going to go ahead and use that unscoped token that we just got back from step one, and we're going to use that uh, to query against a few new APIs. Uh, this will then go and look up what, uh, what projects or domains the group has access to. And by proxy, the federated user would also have access to. Um, the output of these uh, things should be very similar, and you'll see them in v3 slash projects or v3 domains. All right. So once we figure out the target project ID or domain ID, we have our own scope token from step one. We have to now scope it. Here we can actually leverage the existing auth tokens URL. And um, it should be pretty much business as usual at this point. We just uh, have to change, I think, the methods portion. We change that to SAML2. But otherwise, it's more or less the same. We keep the scope uh, format the same. We put the project ID in there. And we put the unscoped token ID in the ID value of SAML2. And the output should be a fully functional Keystone token. Um, it's going to have the extra fields that you need, like the user value over there. Oop, forgot to update that. Should say Steve Marr. And, um, but otherwise, it should have the project ID there, too, and the roles that you have on the project. And it should act as a fully functional Keystone token. You can use it on Nova or Cinder or any other OpenStack service. And um, we're taking that as a success. Um, so this ends the presentation. We're going to talk. We're going to have a few minutes for questions. However, we have additional design sessions coming. As Joe had already talked about, um, Federation's not over. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, we're going to do some cool stuff in Juno, and we have some design sessions coming up today and one tomorrow. Uh, the main one's today at 1:30. It's in room B306. Please drop by. Um, however, I think we're taking a few questions now, right? OK, thanks. Adam, come on. Adam. <laughs> I took notes. Oh, God. Um, OK, first on um, translating what you're saying into English, I'd like to uh, point out that we first had to translate it from the Queen's English. Um, <laughs> I think we all uh, should give a big uh, thank you and round of applause to Professor Chadwick, who started driving this effort, oh, six years ago, eight years ago, before OpenStack. Um, so thank you very much for, Absolutely. For, for being a mentor to all of us on this. Agreed, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, I want to just uh, make something more explicit that you kind of alluded to and then you said mod shib for now. Um, it actually doesn't have to be mod shibboleth in front of Apache. It has to be something that will pass through environment variables from Apache to the backend. And, and mod shib is what these guys have been working with and made sure that we work. So we know that that works. But um, there are several other um, Apache modules that work in similar ways with other things. And so the Federation mechanism is not limited to working with mod shibble. Just wanted to make that explicit, but you did yeah. uh, allude to it. Um, on the PKI thing, um, we can actually pull the signer information out of the token. So okay. I think that's be where we start working on that. Um, and the idea of federate, federated keystone to keystone, um, I think we, we can potentially make happen without having to phone home to the original keystone for every uh, authentication. Um, cool. And then, um, that's uh, actually, I have a question he here that I, uh, you answered afterwards, so good job, guys. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Awesome. Question. No question. <laughs> Lovely comments. Yes. I had a question about uh, other clients, such as JClouds or uh, Fog. Do we, do we reach out to those communities when we make changes to the Keystone APIs, like, for, so that they can get caught up with the changes? You mean to the client? Yeah. Um, we obviously, uh, you know, let us know. We want to make sure we're not breaking anybody and give best practices if they're not using the standard client. So um, sure, this was additive in nature, so it wouldn't be breaking uh, JCloud fogs or or anything like that. But yes, uh, yeah, I mean the, it's added functionality, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's added additional functionality. Stuff. So. Yeah, we have to be there before they can actually start using it. So that okay. it's ready for any JCloud or Fog developer to start picking this up and running with it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Oh, we'll, oh, uh, one more. Sorry. Up. Uh, will will a V3 federated token work against a V2 keystone? So it's a standard, uh, the backend validation process for it would still work. I don't think you'll get back the federated context when you validate the token. So in the V3, is that right, Adam? There is no such thing as a V2 keystone. Can you pass a V3 token to V2? V2. So yes, but in the construct of the V2 response, you wouldn't see that that token was federated. So it's not really good for your auditing records to do that. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you have clients that are still using V2 and you have Keystone V3, um, and for some reason you have, your patch hasn't been accepted yet, or you're still using the V2 client, sure, the token is just the same, right? And it's a string at the end. Okay, so if I get a, all right, so if I if I if I manually get a federated token using curl, for example, yep. and then I pass it into a client that's written for a V2, that's not going to work. Yeah. 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 So I think to sum up the answers, um, ideally use V3. If you're going to use V2, it might work. You might run into some weird problems. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Morgan. Hello. I have a question about the um, Keystone to Keystone authentication. In this case, I was wondering uh, why you set the rules for the users in the first keystone or in the second keystone. And another question is, um, have you thought about the authentication from, not from the command line client, but from a web service, a web server like Horizon or whatever? Is possible to have the Shiba authentication in this case? Or does it work? Okay. The uh, first question is, is where does the actual token scope come from when a role is associated to a user? And it's the wherever the token was issued. So in that, in that diagram that I had, it would be Keystone 1 that initially issued 
that token. Now, what triggered that Keystone One to issue the token could have been a federation that occurred with the employer provided identity provider, or it could have been just username password being passed into that Keystone One. At that point, the token is scoped to that user, to the roles, and, and, and then it's passed elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yes, but in, in this case, the Keystone One can decide what the user can do on the other clouds, right? Because you decide the roles on the first Keystone. Sure. Jorge. It's quite different from normal. Yeah, you should be able to create mappings that sort of limit the scope of what a user can do between one cloud and another. And to Sorry, the, the, it, it isn't actually there at the moment, isn't the keystone to keystone, but when it will be there, it should be quite easy because the token that's issued by keystone one will go over to keystone two, it will be validated, and then attribute mapping will come in and it will map it from exactly. keystone one world into keystone two world, and the user will then have his projects for keystone two. Yes. So you have a double map. Yeah. Well, the bit. Okay, it, it all depends. If, if he logs in with username okay. and password at Keystone 1, there'll be no necessarily any mapping on Keystone yeah. 1. If he comes in federated, there'll be mapping on Keystone 1, and then there'll be addition mapping on Keystone yeah. 2. And, but, I, and ideally, to answer your second question, um, we'd, we'd like to be in a world where if you're doing this service provider type federation, you're, you should get a service catalog that includes additional endpoints that may be in another cloud. So from the perspective of Horizon, you know, nothing really changes aside from the fact that you have additional endpoints that you can provision resources into. So the, the part uh, in the slide where we're doing this communication between Keystone kind of hides away some of those federation you know, protocol implementation stuff, and to the user, you just send a request and treat it as if you would anything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I just want to add, this is ongoing, so we really want to work with you to get this right. Exactly. So this is not, you just gave us a few things. Right. Come back to us, you know who we are, and let's do this together so we get it right. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. I'd like to go back to your uh, to the discussion you had about auditing and, and the interest in auditing. So in the uh, in in the case of trying to track uh, a given ac uh, action within the service to a particular user, I think I heard you say that part of the SAML attribute you'd pass over would be the user ID. Or, or username, or yeah, some user identifier. So talk about, okay, so now that in the SAML attribute, the, the username comes over, but because Keystone doesn't know who that user is, nothing else does either. Uh, so what happens then, right? So the SAML the attribute comes over, gets attributed and, and mapped in appropriately, but how, what do you do with that user ID in order to facilitate the rest of the audit trail? Well, we've also got which identity provider. So we've got an identity provider, and a, and a username. And those are things that we could fill in our CADF event record with. Now, if there's something we need to refine on that, that if that's not good enough, um, you need to come talk to us and we should talk about what we should be adding there so that we make that much easier and, and, and easier to, to have that breadcrumb back to really what happened. I mean, that's the best, that's our straw man. And, but if, if you can help us to think of what's better, uh, please do. So maybe I'm missing it, but so it sounds like as part of the CADF aspect, you would, so let's say, you know, I use that token to now go create, uh, spin up a new server. Yeah. Uh, does that attribute somehow follow in? Well, it's in the token, right? So it's in the token. We should be able to pull it out and with our standard uh, auditing, be able to say this thing was started up or this thing was attached by this username from this identity provider. I mean, that, that's my current thinking. Okay, and it's just because it's passed this metadata, it's not, it, the metadata doesn't mean anything, but because it's passed along, you can then audit and report on it as, well, it meant something in the context of the original identity provider. Yeah, right. So, so hopefully that's enough. Okay. I now, it's TBD to see how well we do there, but but we'll work on it together. Okay. All right. Got you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I saw on the roadmap. I think you had OAuth two. Is the uh, are, are you considering there the use case that I should be able to log on to? Oh, I'd like to log on to Horizon using my GitHub credentials. 
Um, so you're talking from a strict use case of delegation for OAuth too, and what we're looking at is OpenID Connect, which is based on OAuth for the actual authentication, federated authentication. Yeah, so if I wanna, if I'm interested in or I'd like to work on that use case, is that part of what you're thinking about? Is that something you're open to? Is that uh, in the roadmap? So I, I would put that under the, a delegation use case as opposed to a federation use case. But yes, it's something that many people are interested in and, and it should be part of Keystone roadmap overall. I think, I think you did describe a federation use case. You said you want to use a credential from a different identity provider to log into okay. a cloud, and that is federation. Um, and so yeah, you should be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I imagine I'd have to probably have an account for uh, if it's a, if it's a real cloud where I'm going to use resources that are that are chargeable, I probably have to set up an account somewhere. But you need to set up a relationship yeah. so that they that you know that, and that's an out of bound relationship that's going on yeah. uh, between the two providers. But but if yeah. I set up DevStack and turn on GitHub integration, <clears throat> it should be able to just go in. Yeah, that would be cool. Nice. All right, thanks. Okay. We'll wrap it up. No other questions. Alrighty, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.